Okay, why don't I get started? Um, so, okay, what, we, what have we been doing? Um, so last time we considered a bunch of uh, procedures for testing properties of uh, various automata and grammars, the acceptance problem for DFAs, um, for NFAs, um, uh, the acceptance problem, which is really the generation problem for context-free grammars, and emptiness problems for DFAs and, and, and context-free grammars. And also, um, we looked, we, we showed that ATM is Turing recognizable. I, uh, there's a question here in the chat already about that. Yes, we did show that. That was the universal Turing machine that we presented at the end. That's what shows that ATM is Turing recognizable. Um, we mentioned that uh, it's not, ATM is not decidable, uh, which we promised we will prove today, and we will do so. Okay, so that is the plan. Um, proving ATM is undecidable, and we'll introduce the method for doing that called the diagonalization method. I will also show the complement of ATM is uh, Turing unrec unrecognizable. Even though ATM itself is recognizable, the complement is not. And then we will introduce another method called the reducibility method for showing other problems are not decidable and give a, a one example of another problem which is not decidable, assuming we have time to get to it. If not, we will uh, uh, delay that part until uh, next uh, Tuesday's lecture. All right, acceptance problem for uh, Turing machines. As, so just um, as I mentioned, we showed that ATM, um, which is the language of Turing machines and inputs where the machine accepts the input. Um, we showed that was recognizable. We claimed it was decidable. Today, we're gonna prove it's not decidable. All right, now the method uh, that uh, we're gonna use, um, which is really the only method out there um, for proving a, um, some pro you know, a problem was undecidable is the, called the diagonalization method. I mean, ultimately we're gonna show the reducibility method as well, but it really depends on having already shown some other problem undecidable via, via uh, the diagonalization method. So ultimately everything hinges on the diagonalization method, which is really what we have. Um, and uh, so um, to uh, introduce the diagonalization method, I'm gonna um, make a bit of a, a digression into a, a branch of mathematics called set theory or um, it's part of mathematical logic where the method of diagonalization was first uh, conceived of uh, back in the late 19th century by a mathematician called Georg Cantor. Um, and Cantor was considering the problem of how do you compare the relative sizes of infinite sets? You know, for finite sets, um, the uh, the problem of comparing somebody said that uh, Cantor went crazy. That is that is true, um, and maybe I, I I don't know why he went crazy, but um, he um, he did go. Uh, he had uh, some mental problems, unfortunately. Um, and so, how do, so how do we compare the sizes of sets in general? If they're finite sets, we can just count them up. We can say, oh, this set has. Uh, 11 elements and the other set has uh, 10 elements. So the 11, one with 11 is bigger, or if they both have 11, they're the same size. Well, that's not gonna work for infinite sets because you can't count them up. Um, and so he had, Cantor had the following idea for comparing the sizes of infinite sets. Um, and that was basically um, to see whether you can have a function that would map from one set to the other set with certain properties. And those properties are um, called traditionally, well, I mean, in the past have been called the one-to-one -one and onto properties for the function. I'll tell you what that means. Um, but the, the concept is very simple. Um, so a one-to-one -one function is one, a function that's mapping from A to B. Those are the two sets whose sizes we're trying to compare. And, uh, the function being one-to-one -one just means that there are no collisions. If you have two different elements of A, they're never gonna map onto the same element of B. So two different elements of A always map onto two different elements of B. So that's the one-to-one -one property. It's also called injective. Um, and um, 
The other property is called onto or surjective, um, which is that the range of F has to be all of B. So you're not allowed to miss any elements B, you have to hit everything. Um, and when you have the, both of those properties, it, the function is called a one-to-one -one correspondence or a bijection also. Okay, um, now uh, another way of looking at, I don't wanna make this overly more complicated than it needs to be. It just simply means that two sets are considered to be the same size if we can match up the elements with one set with elements of the other set. If you just pair them up. You know, for example, well, if you look, have finite sets, um, that, into, that, that idea, that informal idea just works exactly as you would expect. You know, for example, if we have two sets, here's a set of puppies, here's a set of kittens. Um, now, we wanna show that those two sets have the same size. We could count them up, as I mentioned, and see that there are six elements in both, but it's counting up does not work for infinite sets. So um, we can just match up the elements of the, the puppies with the kittens. And then we know there, we have the same number of puppies as kittens. Okay, now that has the advantage of it making sense when you have infinite sets. So we're just gonna extend that idea and apply it to infinite sets too. And then we'll have a notion of what it means for two infinite sets to have the same size. And you might wonder, what do you get? You know, are all infinite sets of the same size when you use this notion or, or not? How, wh what happens? Um, well, some strange things do happen, but there actually are quite some interesting um, uh, structure there that, uh, that emerges. So, if, um, so anyway, may, may, I don't want to rush on. Uh, questions on any of this, if you want to. Uh, quick question, this hopefully was not too hard, but I want to make sure everybody's together with me on it so we can pop in. Uh, uh, I'll give a few seconds for a chat if you have any uh, questions. Um, the, range, the, the range of the set is all of the elements that you hit as you look at the different possible elements of A. So all of the things that F hits, the standard notion of a range of a function. Um, so the range of S, F has to be equal to B. You have to hit everything. Um, all right. Uh, can you think of a one-to-one -one correspondence as a relabeling? Yeah, I'm not sure that's helpful, but yes, you can think of a, as a relabeling of the elements in a sense, but I, yeah. I just think of it as a matching up. Um, all right, so let's move on. Um, so uh, coming out of this notion of sets of being of the same size, there was this notion of countable sets, as we'll see in a minute. Um, so l l let's do an example. Let's take the set of natural numbers, you know, one, two, three, four, dot, 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 and the set of integers, which includes the natural numbers, but, but also the negative numbers in zero. Um, so the natural numbers are typically re referred to as n, the integers are typically referred to as z, and how do we, wh what do we think of the relative sizes of um, n and z? Well, n is a subset of z. It's a proper subset of z. So you might at first glance think that z is larger and they're not really gonna be of the same size. But it actually, it turns out that there's a very simple way, you know, the arithmetic and the properties of infinite sets are, can be a little bit surprising. And there is a way of matching up all of the elements of z with elements, their own elements of n. Um, and so you can show that as uh, following that definition, that these two sets are in fact of the same size. So let's just quickly go that, go make sure you see that. Um, so here is N, here is Z. I'm gonna write down a table uh, which shows how they match up. You know, here's the function F of N that I'm gonna be describing. That's the one-to-one um, the -one correspondence. And so here are the natural numbers, dot, 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 one through seven, dot, dot, dot. And here are the elements of Z that I'm gonna be matching up. This is how the function is working. So one I'm gonna, you know, f of one is gonna be zero, f of two is gonna be minus one, f of three is gonna be one. Um, and I'm just giving you a way to match up each of the natural numbers with, with integers so that every single integer has its own natural number and vice versa. Um, so four goes to minus two, five goes to two, 
six goes to minus three, seven goes to three, and then minus four, and then four, and minus five, then five, and so on. You're clearly gonna cover all of the integers in this way, and each of the natural numbers is going to have its own integer, and there's never gonna be any collisions. There's never gonna be two natural numbers assigned to the same integer. So this is, meets the, uh, the conditions of a one-to-one -one correspondence and shows that the natural numbers and the, um, and the integers have the same size uh, following this definition. Um, okay, let's do one that's slightly um, more complicated um, and perhaps slightly more surprising, which is that if you consider all of the rational numbers and um, then they have the same, that is a collection, even though the rational numbers seem to be much richer and numer more numerous than the integers. From this perspective, they have the same size. And for the simplicity of my, uh, um, my presentation, I'm gonna consider only the positive rational numbers, which I'm gonna write as Q plus. So those are all of the positive ra rational numbers that can be expressed as a ratio of two natural numbers. And um, I'm gonna show that there is a, a one-to-one -one correspondence between, the between these positive rational numbers and, and the natural numbers. Okay, so um, here I'm gonna again make a table just as I did up, uh, up above. Um, so comparing the natural numbers and the positive rational numbers. And to do that, I'm gonna write down over here on the side just to help you see uh, how I'm getting this table, uh, a table a separate table that, can, that has all of the rational num positive rational numbers appearing, you know, in kind of a nicely organized way. Um, here are all of the rational numbers here that have one as a numerator, that have two as a numerator, and, and so on, and going through uh, across the columns, the different denominators. Um, so it's the, the numbers inside here represent all of the different rational numbers. And so whatever rational number you have, m over n, um, that's gonna appear down in the mth row in the nth column. Uh, that number is going to appear. So they're all going to show up. And I'm gonna use this um, table here to fill out this function. Um, so uh, here are all the natural numbers. And the way I'm going to assign the rational numbers to appear over here is I'm just gonna work my way in from the corner. And I'm gonna do that by kind of doing layers. So first I'll take the one in this, the, the, this number here in this corner, then I'll do these three that surround it, and then these guys that surround that, and these guys sort of in shells going around the previous ones that I've already covered. Okay, so let me, uh, let me illustrate that. Uh, so here's one over one, my first rational number that I'm gonna enter then to the table, They're appearing right over there. So next I'm gonna go two over one, that's gonna appear in the table over there. Now we have two over two. Now that's actually a little bit uh, problematic because two over two has already been done. Um, and if we put that in, uh, because two over two equals one over one, they're both the equal to the rational number one. Uh, so if we put two over two in this table over here, then we would no longer have the one-to-one -one property because both one and three would be mapping to the same point. Um, so we're just gonna simply skip over two over two. Um, I'll show that as kind of graying it out. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna add that one onto the table, onto my function. Um, so but, so we'll, we'll skip over that, we'll go to one over two, which is, um, has not been seen before. And then we're just gonna continue doing the same thing. Now going to this next shell out here. Three over one, three over two, three over three. Same thing, we're gonna skip over that one. Two over three, one over three, I hope you're getting the idea. Um, so I'm not gonna fill this, I ran out of room to uh, put the, fill out this table some more, but just to look at how the, how the process is gonna continue here, I would get four over one. Now four over two, again, is a number we previously seen because that's the, uh, that's the rational number two. We saw that up here when we had two over one, so we're gonna have to skip that one. Four over three, four over four, that was gonna skip, three over four and so on, okay? So by uh, following this procedure, I'm gonna be able to define this function. Now this function is not particularly nice in terms of having a, an elegant closed form, but it is a the total legitimate function in the sense of being a mapping from uh, natural numbers to the positive 
rational numbers. And it has the one-to-one -one correspondence property. So it pairs up each of the natural numbers with each of the um, uh, positive rational numbers. Um, they each get their own mate in a sense. And so that shows that the rational numbers, despite the fact that they're dense and they have all sorts of very sort of more, much bigger seeming, they really, in, from this pers perspective of the sizes of the sets, they have the same size as the uh, uh, natural numbers do. And so with that, it suggests the, de uh, the following definition that a set is countable if it has the same size as the natural numbers or it's finite. Uh, from this perspective, we're gonna be focusing on infinite sets. Uh, but yeah, countable or countably infinite, sometimes people say, uh, if it has the same size as the natural numbers or otherwise you have to include the finite sets as well. And countable means you can just sort of go through the, the, the sets, the, the elements of the set kind of as a list. So you can count them, the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, dot, dot, dot. And once you can do that, and that counting is gonna hit everything, then you know um, you can match them, you can pair them up with the natural numbers, and so therefore you have a countable set, okay? Um, so as we've shown, both Z, the integers, and the positive rational numbers are countable sets, okay? Now, you might think that well, since we're allowing ourselves to do something as arbitrary in a way as this kind of a function to match up the natural numbers with whatever set you're trying to, um, uh, to measure, um, that every set is gonna be countable if you think about it that way, because it seems like you're allowing too, too, too many possibilities and that all the infinite sets are gonna end up being the same size as the natural numbers. Well, that is, in fact is not true. Um, and I don't know, I, 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 Cantor is the one who discovered that. Um, I don't know if that was surprising or not, um, but uh, it is kind of uh, interesting, I think, that there are different sizes of infinities. Um, and uh, so uh, we're gonna now take a look and see uh, that, but be, I wanna, again, um, I wanna uh, stop and make sure we're all together. Can we always find a closed formula for F? Somebody's asking me. Um, I don't know. Uh, for this particular F, uh, you probably could, but it would probably be very messy. Um, um, but in general, that's not a requirement, having a closed form for the, for the mapping function. Any function is allowed, as long as it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, are we all together on this? Is this? Are we comfortable with the notion of some infinite sets having the same size as the natural numbers and therefore we're going to call them countable sets. And we're going to show some other sets are going to have um, more elements. They're going to be uncountable. They're going to be beyond, strictly speaking, strictly larger sets in the sense that we won't be able to put them into a one-to-one -one correspondence with the integers. Um, so is n the smallest infinity? Yes, n is the smallest, um, uh, smallest one. So uh, any infinity is going to have, um, you know, you can always, uh, I don't think you even need it, it, you need a special, you know, you can always, and whenever you have an, a, an infinite collection, you can always find a subset, which is going to be um, uh, a countable subset. Uh, so it's, uh, and it's gonna be the smallest of the infinities, but there are bigger ones. Mm. All right, why don't we move on? Okay, so, um, the example of a set that we will show is not countable, an uncountable set, as we call it, um, is the uh, set of real numbers, which you, uh, you, you know, uh, you, we all know what these are, I hope. Uh, these are all of the numbers that you can express by possibly infinite decimal representations like pi or e squared of two, um, or on, on any of the other familiar ones, you know, um, rational numbers are also um, members of, uh, uh, are also count as real numbers and integers too. Um, and so, uh, but you know, there are these additional numbers that you can get by uh, dec decimal expansions, which may not be rational. Um, and that collection, even though in some ways it looks somewhat similar to the rational numbers, um, the real numbers, I hope I said that right, the real numbers, um, 
uh, the, the uh, which is the set I'm considering here, the ones with the infinite ex decimal expansions, they actually are much larger. Um, so um, the theorem is, and this was discovered by Cantor, um, that uh, R is an uncountable set. And the reason why I'm introducing this is, um, besides that, I think it's interesting um, uh, and, and has some, some relation uh, to uh, the kinds of things we're doing, but it's really for the purposes right now is to introduce this method called diagonalization. Um, okay, uh, that's what we're gonna use later on again, but this is the first time it appeared. Uh, so we're gonna use a proof by contradiction in order to show that R, the collection of real numbers, is uncountable. And we'll assume for contradiction that R is countable. Okay. Um, so if we assume that R is countable, it means we have, by definition, a one to one correspondence from the natural numbers to the real numbers. Okay. So we can match up all of the natural numbers with uh, the real numbers in a one to one and onto fashion. So we can pair up the natural numbers with the real numbers, and we will cover all of the real numbers by doing that. And we can make a table, just like I did before. Here it is. Um, and you can fill this out with all of the real numbers, and um, that was what the assumption means. And I'm gonna show you that that's impossible. Something is gonna go terribly wrong if you do that. Um, now, uh, you might disagree, you might be surprised. You might think, well, uh, Professor Sipser is wrong. Um, you know, that I'm going to work on this overnight and forget the rest of my classes. And I'm going to come up with a list of uh, all the real numbers. I'm going to fill them out here and show that that's impossible. Um, so let's say hypothetically, just for my example's sake, um, here is the list that you came up with. Um, so, you know, you had to match up something with one. Let's say E, had to, that was a special case. So you're gonna stick that with one. And then pi came out to be the number that you, uh, you connected up with uh, two. You wanna see what I'm doing here. I'm making a list. I'm trying to make my, one, my correspondence, my matching up between the natural numbers and my real numbers that I'm hypothesizing to exist for a contradiction. So three, I, I don't know, three is, gets connected to zero. I'm making this up obviously. Uh, not on the spot, I wrote the slide, you know, uh, yesterday, but uh, here's a square root of two showing up for whatever reason, here is one seventh, <laughs> here is some other number, which I'll, I'll be interested if you recognize that one, that's a, that, that's a subtle one. Um, this is 1.234, one point, yeah, some, some familiar looking sequence here, and whatever it is, whatever it is, this is what you came up with, you claim that this is gonna work, as, uh, very good, you, somebody got it. <laughs> it's i to the i-th power, but let, let's not get hung up on that, please. Um, i to the i-th power, oddly enough, can be seen as a real number under, you know, if you define the uh, imaginary exponentiation, uh, which is weird. But anyway, let, 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 let's, not, let, let's not get too distracted. Um, so here's my list of numbers my real numbers that I've matched up in my table here with the natural numbers. Now something is, I claim something goes wrong. What goes wrong? I'm gonna show you that you actually uh, did not do as you claimed. That there's actually um, at least one number that's missing from this list. And I'll exhibit that number. I'm gonna show you what that number is. I'm gonna explicitly come up with a number and show you that there's that number it's missing from the list. Um, so here, it's, it's gonna be a number x. X is, x is the one that's missing. So how am I gonna get x? So x, well, I'm gonna start it off with zero point and then I'm gonna fill out the rest of the places. And how am I gonna get those places? I'm gonna look at the table here. Um, so I'm gonna look at, to get my first digit after the decimal point of x, I'm gonna look at the first digit after the decimal point of the very first number. So I take the first number, look at the first digit after the decimal point, and which happens to be a seven. And the number I'm gonna put in for X is not gonna be seven. It's gonna be anything except seven. Let's say eight. Um, for my next digit of X, I'm gonna look at 
So my second digit of X, I'm going to, after the decimal, everything's going to be after the decimal point now. Uh, so I'm not going to keep saying that. I'm going to look at the second digit of the second number, uh, which is a four, uh, after the decimal point. Um, uh, there it is. And for the second digit of X, I'm going to use something which is anything besides four, five. I have some flexibility here. Um, so I could have used six. I could have used seven. I'm going, for those of you who have seen this before, who are going to nitpick on me, I'm, I'm going to stay away from nine and zero, just because there are some little um, edge cases that arise there, which I don't want to get into because I don't think it's interesting for this argument. Um, but since I have some flexibility, I'm going to avoid zeros and nines. So probably just nines is all I really need. And then um, uh, the argument is just going to work fine. Okay, um, so uh, the next digit is a zero. Uh, for the, you know, the third digit of the third number is a zero. The third digit of X is gonna be anything except for zero, be a one. Then I have a two here. Anything except a two, six. Uh, then a five, anything except a five, a one. A nine, anything except a nine, an eight, and so on. There's an eight. There's a two and dot, dot, dot. I'm just gonna keep doing that. And I'm gonna say, you missed that number, whatever it is. But that number, it's a, that's a number. After I'm all done, it's gonna be the decimal representation of something. And that number, uh, I claim, is absent from the table. And you might say, well, uh, you know, you, it's really there. Um, it's just on the, um, 23rd row, you just didn't get to it in your slide, but it's there. Well, I'm gonna say, I know it's not in the 23rd row because it differs from the number in the 23rd row at the 23rd digit, because I constructed it that way. This number is designed explicitly to be different from each of the numbers that's on the list. Okay, so it can't be on the list because it's been constructed to be different from each of them in at least one place. So it's, I think this is a beautiful argument and it shows that uh, no matter how you try to come up with a one-to-one -one correspondence, you're gonna fail. You know, you might say, oh, you know, like, uh, you know, <laughs> just one number, you know, I did so much hard work and missing just one number, can I get partial credit? you know, and put this one on the list, and now I fix it? No, obviously there are many, many numbers that are missing. If you put this one on the list, I'm gonna construct another number that was missing. So um, this is, uh, you know, th th there's just not no possibility of fixing this. And in fact, you know, the, um, the real numbers are, uh, are uncountable, cannot be matched up with the natural numbers, and there's nothing, you, it can't even come, it doesn't even come close. Um, so um, here's summary of what I just said. Um, F is not a one-to-one -one correspondence, no matter what you try to do. You can't come up with a one-to-one -one correspondence. So that's the contradiction. Okay, so that proves that R is uncountable. Okay, and that's why, by the way, we call this a diagonalization, because we're going down this diagonal here. That's where the term, that's where the name has come from. Okay. Um, so I, I, I'm happy to, <laughs> okay, that's it. Uh, somebody's asking me, <laughs> I'm actually, I have a, um, is it here? I can't remember if it's here. I have a uh, check-in coming uh, about this and somebody is kind of um, anticipating that by asking uh, the, the actual rather famous question about there being a possible infinity in between the natural numbers and the real numbers. We know the real numbers now are bigger than the natural numbers, but is there something that's an in-between? I mean, this is a very, very famous problem, um, uh, which I'll talk about you know, when we get to our check-in, which is coming up. Um, well, somebody is objecting just the, the way I've defined X using this procedure that really, really can't, in a sense, state, you know, but it, X is a number, X is the result of, what, what this procedure is, it's, you know, following this procedure, we're converging on some particular value. And so that is a value. Um, if you want, you know, we can make a more 
precise way of determining. I mean, I, so I, we don't have the flexibility of choosing the way I did in my example. We can make a precise uh, procedure for coming up with these digits. But um, I don't think there's anybody thinks there's anything that's, um, uh, there's any shortcoming in this argument um, in terms of the way we're defining X. It's, I, I think it's worth understanding this um, because it's really gonna set the uh, groundwork for our proof that ATM is undecidable, which is a little, I think, a, perhaps slightly more abstract in a way, um, in the way it sort of comes across. I'm gonna to try to con make, connect the two, but uh, I think it's helpful to understand at least this argument because this argument is kind of diagonalization in its kind of most uh, raw form. Um, all right, I think we're good. Um, so let, why don't we continue then? Um, so there are a number of corollaries that follow from the statement that the real numbers is uncountable. Um, uh, uh, first of all, if you let script L be the collection of all languages, if you want to consider it over some particular alphabet, that's fine, but that's not going to be really uh, you know, important for this uh, um, point that I'm try going to make. So uh, L, uh, script L is the collection of all languages. Um, so every subset of sigma star, every subset of sigma star is a language. Um, so look at all those possible subsets. Um, so that includes, you know, zero to the K, one to the K, plus every other language you can ever think of and more, all possible languages. Um, so that, uh, the collection of all languages is uncountable. Uh, there's uncountably many different languages out there. I don't want to belabor this point. You can just take this if you don't quite follow the, the, the quick argument I'm going to make here, but um, uh, you can make a correspondence, one-to-one -one correspondence from all languages to the reals so that each language gets its own real number. And the way I'm going to think about that, let's put the real numbers into binary form. And if you imagine here being sigma star, all of the possible strings of sigma star, you know, written out in their standard order. Um, and now if you have a language here, A, it's just some arbitrary language. So that's gonna have some of the strings of, um, of sigma star appearing, like zero is appearing, but one is not appearing. Zero, zero is appearing and zero, one, but not these three. Um, and I'm gonna associate to A, my language, some real number in binary by putting in a, a zero in the decimal representation, well, the binary representation, I should say, um, for that uh, string, uh, if it's not there, and a one if it is there. Um, and so a real number, because there's infinite many, infinitely many yes, no choices in the binary representation, can represent a language because of each of the yes, no choices of a string being present or not. I'm going to put a one for when the string is present, a zero when it's not present. So each uh, language has its own real number and each real number is going to be associated to its own uh, language. Here I'm restricting myself to, to real numbers between zero and one. Uh, that's not going to be an essential point. So let's not get hung up on that. Uh, so um, uh, the, uh, the fact that the, um, the languages can be uh, uh, putting it into a one-to-one -one correspondence with the real numbers um, uh, shows that the collection of all languages is also uncountable. Uh, now, another observation here, another point worth noting, is that if you look at sigma star itself, the strings, uh, all possible strings, that's a countable set. The collection of all possible languages is uncountable, but the collection of all possible finite strings is countable because I can just list them. Here is my list of all possible strings, which you can put into a table if you like to think of it matching up with the natural numbers in that way. Now I'm, get, I'm trying to make a point here, which is that if you take M, which is all possible Turing machines, script M is all possible Turing machines, the collection of all possible Turing machines is countable. There are only countably many different Turing machines. And you can argue that in all sorts of messy different ways, but I think the most simple way to see that is to think about 
each Turing machine is having a description, which is a string. So the collection of all descriptions of Turing machines is just a subset of sigma star, which we already know is countable. And the subset of any countable set is going to be countable. So um, uh, anyway, uh, I think it's worth remembering um, that uh, the collection of all Turing machines is countable, um, whereas the collection of all languages is uncountable. And that tells you right there that some language is not decidable because there are more languages than Turing machines. We have uncountably many language, only countably many Turing machines. So that's fewer Turing machines than languages. There's no way to map all the languages onto Turing machines. So there's gonna always be some languages that got unmapped. Um, and so in particular, there are gonna be some languages which are undecidable. There are gonna be some languages which are not Turing recognizable. And anything based on some automata kind of um, uh, defini definition process, it's going to be some languages that you're not going to be not going to be defined. Um, okay, now what this corollary shows you that there is some language out there which is not decidable. What we're going to show next is that there is a specific language, ATM, which is not decidable. Okay, and but first I think we have a check-in coming up. And uh, let me give you a little bit of background here because this is relevant to this question that I got um, about intermediate size sets. So uh, the question of whether there is a set of size between the natural numbers and the real net numbers, um, strictly in between. So bigger than the natural numbers, not the same size as the natural numbers, but not the same size as the real numbers either, so, um, but in between uh, in size. Um, uh, that was Hilbert's question number one out of his list of 23 that I talked about uh, a few lectures back. Um, it's interesting that he put it as number one in that very privileged special place, uh, because I know Hilbert was very, um, uh, he felt that the understanding infinity was a really central issue in mathematics. And that if we can't answer a question like this, we don't really understand infinity. Um, uh, you want to understand what kind of sizes of infinities are there? Um, we know there's the real numbers bigger than the, in, than the natural numbers. Is there something in between? So, so fundamental, really. Um, but uh, it was shown uh, during the course of the 20th century, really in two separate steps, one in the 1930s by Gödel, one in the early 1970s by Cohen, that we can't answer this question by using the standard axioms of mathematics. You know, it's the, the answer can go either way. And it's, both of them are consistent with the axioms of mathematics. So you're never going to be able to prove that there is a set whose size is in between or that, you, or that there is no such set. It's just impossible to prove either, direct, either way using the standard axiom of mathematics, which actually is a kind of remarkable. Um, and so my question for you is, and this is really a philosophical question, not one that um, is directly, and you need to know about material in the course, just I think it's just a matter of your own interest, I hope you find it interesting. If you don't, you, you pick a random, you can just answer it randomly. Um, but um, what's going on here that we can't answer that question about whether there is a set of intermediate size? Is it because our axioms for mathematics are inadequate? Or maybe there is no such thing as a mathematical reality. You can talk about, you know, you know, what's, the, what's real here? What, 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 what's the reality? Either there is a set in between or not. If you imagine all of these things have their own reality to them, well, then there's going to be an answer. And then you would expect, well, maybe we could find better axioms, which will actually give us that answer. Or you can say, well, there is no reality. And, um, you know, it, it, infinite sets are kind of human constructs anyway, so we can make them kind of play out any way we like. Mathematicians argue about that to this day. Um, and um, it is, as I say, a really, it's a philosophical question, but just out of curiosity, let's see how you guys end up uh, deciding on that one. Um, so here's the poll. Five seconds to go, please vote. And uh, we're gonna end the polling one, two, three now. All right, here we go. So there's no right answer. Um, I think if most mathematicians were to, um, I think the instinct of most logicians, especially, I'm not sure our general mathematicians really even care about this question, but logicians, um, 
would probably have an instinct that probably there are sets in between. There's no reason that there shouldn't be. Um, you know, it seems kind of strange that there should be this sort of jump uh, from the natural numbers to the real numbers, and why nothing in between? Um, but um, it's, uh, I don't think that question is really settled. Um, uh, so, all right, let's continue on. I think we are, um, okay, so we're gonna, um, our coffee break is coming in case you're wondering. So this is on my last slide before then, but this is an important slide. So please uh, hold, hold, hold out. Um, so here is our uh, promised theorem of the day. I'm gonna show that ATM is not decidable, the acceptance problem for Turing machines. And uh, it's all gonna be contained on this one slide. We're gonna give a proof by contradiction using diagonalization. Uh, and we're gonna assume some Turing machine H decides ATM. And we're gonna get a contradiction. So let's first of all, make sure we understand what H is doing. So H gets an input, a Turing machine and an input. And H is gonna be a decider. So it always halts with an accept or a reject. It's supposed to accept if M accepts W and reject if it doesn't. So in other words, it's gonna reject if M rejects W either by, halt, by halting or by looping. That's the job of H. And we're assuming we can do that, um, but we will see a contradiction occur. So the way we're gonna do that is, is really kind of just one step here in a way. And we're gonna use H to construct another Turing machine D. H is gonna be a subroutine to D. We've already seen us doing that in the past. D is gonna do something a little strange, um, just, to, just to warn you. Um, D's input is just a Turing machine, no, in, no W. And what D is gonna do using its subroutine H is gonna simulate H on input M comma the description of M. Now, what is that? Well, the description of M is just some string. So what H is trying, what it's asking H uh, to tell, to answer is does M accept the string representing M's own description. It's as if we're feeding M into itself, which seems like a totally twisted thing to do. Um, you might say, uh, you know, why would you ever feed a program into itself? <laughs> Somebody's written cannibalism here. Yeah, kind of. Uh, except it's it's worse <laughs> because it's not eating somebody else; it's eating yourself. Okay, but um, I claim that we actually there are actual cases in practice where we do this. We uh, feed programs into themselves, um, and uh, the example that I know of where this is done is when you're making a compiler you might want to make a compiler and then written in the same language that it's compiling and then you feed the compiler into itself. You may say, why, why even bother? Because it's already obviously, if it, once it's running, you don't need to um, uh, compile it again. Um, but actually, you know, an example where this was really used was when uh, there was an optimizing compiler, I think for C, uh, written on early Unix machines. And the optimizing compiler for C was written in C. So you would feed the optimizing compiler um, into the regular compiler, first of all. Now you had the um, co compiler running, but it was unoptimized. So, but now that it's the optimizing compiler is running, you can feed the optimizing compiler into that, which is itself. Now you have an optimized optimizing compiler. So it really uh, makes some, there is a, at least some, one case where this has actually been done uh, in practice. Um, not that we really care, this is a theory class, but just for fun. 
to observe that. So here, H is trying to say, well, does N A M end up accepting when it's fed the description of itself? You know, at least mathematically speaking, that's a reasonable uh, thing to ask. And then what D is going to do when it gets the answer back from H, H is a decider, don't forget, is D is going to do the opposite, whatever, whatever H does. It's going to accept if H rejects and reject if H accepts. Um, so let's, in summary, let's pull this together. So, so you know, we, it, it's easy to understand in the end, what is D doing? D is going to accept, D is also, also going to be a decider, by the way. So D, D is always going to either accept or reject just the opposite of what H tells it to do. So D is going to accept M exactly when M doesn't accept M, because you know, when M doesn't accept M, H is going to reject, um, and so then D is going to accept. So D accepts M if and only if M doesn't accept M. That's exactly the condition in which D accepts M. I think it's important to just step back and make sure you understand this line, because we have only one line left to get our contradiction, right? Are we together? D accepts M if and only if M doesn't accept M. That's just by the that way we've defined setup D. Now, what we're gonna do is feed in, instead of M to D, and not some arbitrary feed, we're, we're gonna use feed in D into D. And that is gonna be our contradiction because D is now gonna accept D if and only if D doesn't accept D, and that's certainly impossible. Okay, that's our contradiction, which proves that H cannot exist, and therefore ATM is undecidable. Okay, so we're done, except for the one point, which is that, um, why is this a diagonalization? And I think you can get that from the following picture. If you imagine here writing down all possible time, I'm making, I'm gonna make a table here. Here is a list of all Turing machines. Okay, uh, including D, which is a machine which I um, built under the assumption that H exists. So D appears here somewhere, but here are the, all the other Turing machines. And here are all of the descriptions of the Turing machines along the uh, labeling all of the columns. Okay, so these are the rows labeled, these are the column labels. And inside, I'm gonna tell you uh, the answer for whether a given machine accepts a given input. So for example, M1 accepts its own description, but rejects the description of M2, but accepts the description of M3. I don't know, you know, I'm obviously making this up. I don't know what M1 is, but just hypothetically, that's what the machine M1 does. Um, so I'm just filling out this table. And you know, this is the, the D, uh, uh, H could get the answer to any of the elements in this table because it can test whether M4 um, accepts the description of M3. So it could, H could fill out this table. So maybe M2 is a machine that always rejects. It's a very unfriendly rejecting machine. M3 is a very friendly machine. It accepts all inputs. M4 rejects some and accepts other, dot, dot, dot. Now I wanna look and see what does D do? Um, now, based on the information that I've already given you, we can understand what D does. So for example, what does D do when I feed it the description of M1. What does D do? Well, we can look over here. D accepts M if and only if M doesn't accept M. So D is going to accept um, M1 if and only if M1 does not accept M1. Well, M1 does accept M1. So D does the opposite. D rejects. So, okay, I'm highlighting here. D rejects because it's going to, D is going to do the opposite of what the machine does on its own, in, on, on, on input. Um, so M2 on, so D on M2, you have to look what M2 does on M2. It rejects, so D does the opposite of that, it accepts. And similarly, uh, you know, all, each one of these things, D's answer is going to be the opposite of what the machine does on its own description. Um, just by virtue of the definition of D. Okay, and so on. So far, so good. But the problem is what happens when D is FedEx itself? Because as you can see, 
you know, um, we're, we're, heading for pro we're heading for trouble because this is a diagonal down here. D is just one of the rows. That diagonal is going to ex intersect that row at this point. And D is defined to be going to be doing the opposite of what that element is, but it can't be the opposite of itself. Okay, and so that's, that's the contradiction. So I think, you know, we're, um, uh, I, I I'm gonna call us, give us a little break here. Um, and then we can also text me in the meantime, we'll be happy to answer some questions during, during that. A little over four minutes to go. So if, let's see, uh, let me see if I can answer your questions. Okay, what's so special about ATM that enables us to do this? Why can't we do this on ADFA, for example? Um, so that's a good question. I, 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 and um, the answer is that um, um, you know, you know, in a sense, you know, we can do this on DFA. I mean, I, I think this is perhaps a bit bit of a stretch, but you know, DFAs could not answer ADFA. I mean, we, we could prove that in other ways as well, you know, by, because, uh, you know, we could use things like the pumping lemma and it's not clear even how you'd formulate ADFA. But what's important here is that the, um, uh, it's really the model talking about itself um, that really is where the problem comes up. So if you try to push this argument through to show that ADFA is not decidable by Turing machines, you're gonna fail. Um, because you know we're starting off with a Turing machine, and um, I mean, I think I'm going to confuse myself if I try to just repeat it. But um, you 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 won't get a contradiction because a Turing machine is not a finite automaton. Um, okay. Um, will this argument get into self loops? I don't see why there was there is some self reference perhaps. We're going to talk about that a little later. So we're going to come back and revisit this argument, um, you know, in a in a week or so when we talk about the recursion theorem, which talks about machines that can refer to themselves. Um, but this is a little bit of a head, what, getting ahead of ourselves. So uh, somebody's commenting on this, reminding them of the Barber paradox. If you remember that, the uh, which has some similarity, you know the. There is a town in which uh, there is a barber which shaves every man who doesn't shave themselves. It seems, you know, he's a very good barber. So there are some people who shave themselves and all the rest, the barber shaves. Uh, the question is, does the barber shave himself? Because he shaves only those men who don't shave themselves. So you got a same kind of a contradiction. There, there, is, a, there is a relationship there. Um, so somebody wants to know, where did we use the decidability? So we used the decidability to come up with H. Um, you know, once we know that ATM is decidable, then we have that H function and then we can build D. Um, so that's where, that's the, the, the chain of, that's the chain of reasoning. Um, so you assume ATM is decidable, then you have the decider and then called H and then you can build D. Um, Somebody wants to see the previous slide. Well, uh, what part of the slide do you want? <laughs> uh, so I'll leave that up there. Why can't, we, why can't we apply the proof that all Turing machines are countable to all languages? Well, because Turing machines have descriptions. Languages, general languages don't have descriptions. And so that's uh, why. Okay, the candle has burned to the, to, to the bottom and it's time to move on. Um, uh, so now let's look at the uh, acceptance problem for Q automata. I'll give you a Q automaton, an input, and I want to know, does it accept the input? Is that going to be decidable? And you, ha you have your choices. It's either yes, it is decidable, because these are similar to put down automata, and APDA is decidable, or no, because yes would con contradict re results that we know at this point, or we don't have enough information to answer the question. Okay, let's put that up. One second. <laughs> All right, that's it, ready, going, gone. Uh, so yes, the answer is, uh, well, no. <laughs> the answer is, the, indeed the answer is B. 
Um, uh, true that uh, Q automata are similar to push on automata, but all these automata are kind of similar to each other and that's not gonna be good enough. Uh, well, the homework has asked you to do is to show that you can simulate Turing machines with Q automata. So if you can answer the question about whether Q automata uh, will accept their input, that would allow you to be able to answer questions about whether Turing machines accept their input. And we just proved that's not possible. So um, uh, it would get a, be a contradiction if we could answer, uh, if we could decide A, Q, A. Now we have an example of an undecidable language. Let's look at an example of an unrecognizable language. Now, ATM is not gonna serve uh, that purpose because ATM um, is um, recognizable, is Turing recognizable, as we pointed out by the universal Turing machine. So uh, ATM is undecidable, however. How about an unrecognizable language? Um, for that, we will see that the complement of ATM will serve. So the complement of ATM is neither decidable nor even recognizable. That's not Turing recognizable. And that's gonna follow from a pretty basic theorem that connects recognizability and decidability that I've put up here on the screen, which is that if you have a language where it and its complement are both recognizable, then the language turn out, turns out to be decidable. In fact, the language and its complement are decidable, but being decidable is closed under complement. So that's something you should be aware of. Um, but being, uh, well, okay. Uh, We'll get to that in a minute, but uh, if, um, uh, so anyway, so we have a language and it's complement both recognizable, how do we know the language is decidable? So first of all, let's take uh, the two Turing machines, M1 and M2, that recognizes A and A complement. Um, and we're gonna put those together to get a decider for A. Um, and that's gonna work like this. It's gonna be called T. So T says on input W, what it's gonna do, it's gonna feed W into M1 and M2 both. Um, a is a language, by the way, yes. A is, when, I'm when I say it's Turing recognizable, you know, Turing recognizable only applies to languages. So, so yes, A um, is often the symbol I'm gonna use for languages, sometimes for an automaton, but um, A is typically gonna be a language. So, um, if, uh, so uh, now I'm trying to make T be a decider for A uh, from the recognizers for A and A complement. So I'm gonna take an input to T and feed it into both recognizers, M1 and M2. Okay, I'm gonna run them in parallel. What's nice is that because um, M2 is a, recognizes the complement of what M1 recognizes, every string is gonna be accepted either by M1 or by M2, because every string is either an A or an A complement. So if I run M1 and M2 on W until one of them halts, one of them accepts, I know I'm not gonna run forever because eventually one or the other one have to accept. So, and then I got my answer. Because if M1 accepts, then I know I'm in the language. But if M2 accepts, I know I'm in the complement of the language, so I'm out of the language. So if M1 accepts, then T should accept. If M2 accepts, then T should reject. Um, now, uh, so that proves that uh, nice little theorem uh, written at the top in blue. Um, so I got my decider for A built out of the recognizers for A and A complement. Now, immediately it follows that the complement of ATM is not Turing recognizable because we know um, that ATM itself is recognizable, but it's undecidable. If its complement were also recognized, if the complement was also recognizable, then ATM would be decidable, but it isn't. So when something is undecidable, either it or its complement have to be unrecognizable. And in the case for ATM, it has to be the complement because we already showed that it is itself is recognizable. Um, 
So that's the proof of that. So here is a little picture of the way the world looks right now. If you have here in the middle are the decidable languages. See, these are all languages here. There's a Venn diagram of languages. Kind of we showed earlier, you know, like the regular, the context-free, decidable, recognizable. Here I've got the recognizable and what I'm calling the co-turing co, co recognizable. This is the collection of all complements of recognizable languages. So ATM bar, ATM complement, is the complement of a recognizable language. This uh, uh, region here is, are all the complements of the recognizable languages or the so-called co-turing uh, recognizable languages, complement of. Um, so ATM is on this side, ATM complement is on that side, but if something's in both, by virtue of this theorem here, then it's decidable. Okay, last check-in for the day. Um, from what we've learned so far, um, which closure properties can we prove for the class of the Turing recognizable languages? Choose all that apply. Well, as I say, you don't have to get it right. Let's, let's not spend too much more time on this because we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it. Um, almost all, it's closed under almost all of them, but not all of them. Uh, because, you know, are we done here? I think we're done. Five seconds. Okay, here we go, ending polling. I'm not sure what the meaning of <laughs> the leading answer is here. Uh, everybody likes union, I guess. They're closed under all of these operations except complement. So, um, but we just proved it's not closed under complement. So I'm a little, you know, a little puzzled by why we have so many votes for closure under complement. Uh, we have here ATM is Turing recognizable, but ATM complement is not Turing recognizable. So right here on the slide. So uh, I'm not trying to make you feel bad, but uh, um, I'm trying to just point out that you think, please. Um, so um, now closure under union and intersection, I mean, you could kind of get those answers just by running things in parallel the way we did the proof here. You just run both machines um, and uh, um, if they both uh, uh, give, I mean, it's a little tricky, I suppose. You know, if, if, if either one of them accept, um, uh, then you can accept, or if they both accept, you just wait until they both have accepted, otherwise you just keep running. Um, so the first two are pretty straightforward. Um, closure under concatenation is also gonna be similar. You just try every possible way of cutting uh, the string up into two pieces and run in parallel on, and if you ever find a way of cutting it up and you run those two in, in those two sides in parallel and if they both um, accept, um, then, uh, then you can accept. And star is, very, again, very similar. So these are not too bad, um, but I admit, you know, it's not a whole lot of time to uh, have to contend with something uh, that you're just getting uh, used to. So let, let's, um, uh, let's, talk about the very last topic of the day, which is really going to be setting ourselves up for um, Tuesday's lecture next week. Mm -hmm. And that's how we are going to be showing other languages are undecidable, which is something that um, I'm going to be expecting you guys to be able to do. Um, uh, this is um, the standard procedure for showing languages are undecidable using what's called the reducibility method. Um, and what that does is it takes as a starting point a language that we already know is undecidable, typically ATM. Or it could be another one that you've previously shown to be undecidable. And leverages that information to show other languages are undecidable. And um, uh, it's using what's called reducibility. We're going to go into this um, more carefully next time. But basically, reducibility is a way of using one problem to solve another problem. And so uh, we're going to show, for example, uh, let's take a look at the problem called the halting, the halting problem, which is like the famous problem for Turing machines. Um, uh, you just want to know whether it halts, not necessarily whether it accepts. 
So it's very similar, but not exactly the same. Um, and we're going to show that this halting problem is similarly undecidable. Now we could go back and do the whole diagonalization, but that seems like, uh, more, well, that's more work than necessary now that we already know ATM is undecidable because we're going to show that we can reduce the ATM problem to the halt, halting problem. Um, and we'll explain what that means again uh, later. But um, the idea is, and as, I will, as we'll show in an illustration uh, shortly, uh, that by proving by contradiction, um, if the halting, if halt TM were decidable, then ATM would be decidable. And we know ATM is not decidable. And so um, that's our contradiction. Now, uh, the way we're going to show that if whole TM is decidable, then ATM is decide decidable, is use a decider for whole TM to decide ATM with a suitable, um, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, modification. So basically, we're going to turn a, a whole TM decider into an ATM decider. And that's what, how we're going to reduce the problem of solving ATM to the problem of solving Holt TM. Let, let's just do an example. I, you know, if you've seen it before, obviously this is not going to be hard. But for the many of you who have not seen it before, I, it, I'm partly doing it this time just so we can do it again next time. And maybe it'll sink in by virtue of repetition. So... Um, so again, so as I just said, we're going to assume the whole TM problem is decidable and use that to show that ATM is decidable, which we know is false. We showed it just earlier that it's not. Uh, so assume we have a decider for whole TM, we'll call it R. And we're going to just construct from R a decider for ATM, we'll call S. Okay, so we're again, typical proof by contradiction, we're assuming the opposite of what we're trying to prove, and then we're going to get something crazy. Okay, so here my job now is I'm assuming I have R, which is a whole TM decider. So now I'm assuming I know how to uh, decide if a Turing machine and an input eventually halts. Not necessarily what it accepts, just whether it halts. You know, it's conceivable, you know, uh, you have to bear with me here. It's conceivable that you could find a way to test whether, the, uh, you know, Turing machines halt on their input, even though we now know that testing whether they accept their input um, is not decidable. Um, so you have to kind of be open-minded to the possibility that we can, um, that the halt problem is decidable. And we're going to show that that can't be. So we're going to show that if we could decide the Holton problem, then we can use that to decide the, uh, the acceptance problem. Okay, so how do we, how do we gonna do that? So imagine now we can solve the halting problem. So to solve the ATM, which is what my job is to do, uh, so S is supposed to solve ATM. I'm constructing Turing machine S to decide ATM. I'm gonna use first, I'm given an M and W, I'm gonna feed it into R since that's really all I got. See if R um, tells me what happens, uh, does M on W at least halt? Well, if R says no, it doesn't halt. Well, then, I, then I'm actually done. Because if it, M doesn't even halt on W, then it couldn't be accepting W. So at that point, I know that M doesn't accept W and I can reject it right off. So R, you can see how it could potentially be helpful, but it's gonna be helpful in either way. Because if R, if R says M does halt, well, then I'm also good. Because I don't know the answer yet, but what I do know is I can now simulate M on W until it halts, because R has told me it halts. So I don't have to worry about getting into a loop. Um, uh, so S can be confident in being a decider for whatever it's doing, um, because I'm running uh, now M on W with a guarantee that it holds. Um, and now that's going to tell me, now eventually the simulation of M on W is going to end up at an accept or reject, and that's going to be the answer I need. 
So if M is accepted, then accept, and if M is rejected, then reject. And that's how S solves ATM using R, which, which solves whole TM. But S can't exist. And so therefore R can't exist and therefore whole TM can't be decidable. Okay, so that quickly, um, okay. I'm not sure which diagram you wanted me to show, but anyway, maybe we can do that. We're basically at the end of the hour or end of the 90 minutes. So let's do a quick review. And if you stick around, I'm happy to go back and look at any of the other slides uh, that you might've missed something on. Okay, so just to recap, we showed that uh, the natural numbers of the real numbers are not the same size using that definition of one-to-one -one correspondence to introduce the diagonalization method. We use the diagonalization method to show that ATM is undecidable. We also showed that little theorem that if the language and its complement are recognizable, then the language is decidable. And from that, we concluded that ATM complement is not recognizable. And then we showed, at least by virtue of an introduction to the method, the reducibility method to show that whole TM is undecidable. Okay, and that's, that, that was today's lecture. And we're, and we're uh, at the end of the hour. So why don't I, um, you know, we are finished. Uh, you can uh, log out. Um, and uh, if you want, I will stick around. Okay, the, okay, this is kind of a good question here. Um, so I'm getting a question about the uh, ATM complement, um, which is, uh, you know, since we have a, a, a recognizer for ATM, uh, if I'm doing justice to this uh, question, uh, we have a we have a recognizer for ATM. So why can't we just invert the answer? You know, flip flip the answer around, and now we have a recognizer for the complement of ATM. ATM complement. Um, so why doesn't that work? Well, the reason that doesn't work is because the recognizer for ATM might be rejecting some things by looping. And now if you just flip the accepting and rejecting, um, when it hits one of those uh, halting states, it's gonna give the reverse answer. But the, uh, when it uh, rejects by looping, it'll continue to reject by looping. So you won't get the complementary language coming out. Uh, so, you know, if we want, you know, if it would be helpful, I can go back to that uh, slide here, um, which proves that ATM complement is unrecognizable um, because maybe we should start with the bottom. We know that ATM is recognizable and undecidable. Right, we already proved those two facts. ATM is recognizable um, from the um, universal Turing machine and it's undecidable by the diagonalization argument. Um, those two things together tell us that the complement has to be unrecognizable because if a language and its complement are both recognizable and we already know the language itself is recognizable, so now if the complement is also recognizable, the language is gonna be decidable by the upper theorem. So it must be the case that either the language itself is unrecognizable or its complement is unrecognizable. We know the language is recognizable. That's what the universal Turing machine told us. So the only thing left is for the complement to be unrecognizable. It, you, you should review that if you didn't get it um, because this is a kind of, you know, kind of reasoning we, you know, we, we're going to be building on things like that. So I think it's good, uh, go, good to make sure you understand. Okay. Um, okay, the diagram on the right. So this is just a Venn diagram here. Kind of threw this in at the last minute here. I was worried about it being confusing. You know, th that part is, um, uh, you know, so, you know, I'm trying to show that the three classes that we've already talked about, the languages which are decidable, 
the languages which are Turing recognizable, and the languages whose complements are Turing recognizable. Those are three separate classes of languages. And those come up here in those three regions. These are the, the decidable ones. Here are the recognizable ones. And here are the ones whose complements are recognizable. Now, if a language is in both the recognizable and its complement is recognizable, so it's in both of these bigger regions here, then this theorem tells you it's decidable. So that's why the intersection of these two regions is marked as being decidable, because that means you're in both. Okay. But we know that ATM is sitting out here as recognizable, but not decidable. So it, ATM is in the recognizable side, but it's not on the complement of recognizable, ATM itself. Um, the complement of ATM is the complement of a recognizable, but itself is not recognizable um, and uh, not decidable. So you get this sort of nice, you know, pick, I, mean, I hope it's, you think it's nice, but it's uh, sort of a, trying to summarize things in this, in this little Venn diagram. So I think I'm going to then uh, sign off and um, I'll see you all on Tuesday and have a good weekend. Bye-bye.